Hi, welcome back. Welcome back. I uh, <coughs> I apologize for keeping you late uh, on class on Monday, but it's a topic that I can barely squeeze into two hours. But uh, I had about two hours and fifteen minutes. So I'll I'll recap the stuff you guys may have missed in a second. Uh, but first, I want to check: Did everyone get the email about the exam soft? Yes. Is everyone able to download the software? Uh, you were supposed to. Okay. Let me explain it like this. If you're not able to do it today, try it tomorrow. If you can't do it tomorrow, go ask the registrar. If you can't cannot get it to work by Monday, or it crashes on Monday, you have one option. Blue book. Um, write it out by hand. We don't have tech support here, unfortunately. And if you frantically try and get your computer fixed while the exam's ongoing, you will waste your 90 minutes. Um, so I would not recommend it. So try to get it work today or tomorrow or on Friday. But if by Monday you can't get to work for whatever reason, you can't find another computer, um, just prepare to write it out by hand. Uh, the exam will begin Monday morning, the, uh, Monday at 5.30 in this room. Um, Rebecca, who you know and trust, will hand out papers. She'll hand out the exams. Uh, if it's electronic, you submit it online. If it's on paper, she'll collect the blue books for me and give it to me later. Um, do not ask her any questions. Uh, I told her don't answer them, but just in case you're tempted, don't ask her any questions. Um, if the exam isn't clear, do the best you can. Uh, I've done my best to make the question as clear and uh, uh, simple to understand as possible, but if you don't get it, uh, do the best you can. Um, because on the exam day, you can't ask any questions. You're stuck with uh, whatever you got in your head. Again, it's a totally open book. Bring whatever you want. Any questions? Yes? This clarification uh, Our fall 2014 student ID numbers, like test numbers, what you want? No, 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 no. Go to Stanley and you can check for your new exam number. Okay, so use it because on the instruction set, <coughs> 2014. That was probably a, a typo from last semester. Yeah, yeah. Use. Double check. You're, you're you read more closely than I do, apparently. Yeah. Uh, was that your same question? I like you guys. You guys read. I just copied and pasted what they told me to do. I didn't actually read it. But uh, yeah, so uh, go get your most recent exam number. Um, one note, I will try to grade these as quickly as I can. So the purpose of this, again, is a wake-up call. It's not to scare you. It's not to penalize you. But I want to make sure that you get feedback in a timely manner. Uh, for my end, though, these are extremely time-consuming. They take me about 30 minutes to read each paper. I don't, I don't blow through these. So uh, I'll do my best to get it done in a couple weeks. But you will have feedback well before you have to uh, you know, start cramming for the final. But I, I will do my best on my part. This is the first year they're actually making us do midterms. If you notice, they didn't have this last year. So this is a new thing which we have to deal with. Any other questions? Should be good? OK. All right, so briefly, let me recap NFIB, because I, I apologize. I don't like to keep you late, especially with people at night, because I know you have families and jobs and other things that you need to uh, leave for. Um, there were three main aspects of the case. The commerce necessary and proper clause, taxing power, and the Medicaid expansion. The Chief Justice held that with respect to the Commerce Clause, Congress could not impose the mandate because it was not a regulation of commerce. It was forcing people into commerce, and that was beyond their power. With respect to the necessary and proper, the court held that even if it was necessary or convenient to have a mandate in order to enact the Affordable Care Act, it was not proper because it intruded onto the sovereignty of the state and the individual. It, 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 it altered the balance between the people and their government that it made people do stuff. Um, that was a fuzzy holding, which I don't pretend is clear, uh, but, but that, that was the, the uh, Chief Justice reasoning. The part that breaks my heart every time I read it is the taxing power argument. The Chief Justice first held that Congress did not enact the tax. It wasn't a tax. But because the statute could be read as a tax in order to save its constitutionality, the statute must be so read. This was his uh, infamous saving construction, if you will. The final portion of the Chief Justice's controlling opinion involved the Medicaid expansion. The Chief Justice said that states cannot be given the choice of expand Medicaid or lose all of your funding. There is no actual choice there. Therefore, states must be given a choice. He once again rewrote the statute to allow states the option of opting into the Obamacare expansion. And if a state like Texas chooses not to, they can maintain their old funding. So in the end, the Affordable Care Act basically survives in its entirety with the small exception that states cannot be forced to expand Medicaid for its poorest citizens. How's that? Questions on that? Yes, ma'am. OK. Um, the saving construction. So are we to read, then, that now um, the court can rewrite legislation? Are they 
are we blurring power and separation because they, uh, or I should say, uh, Roberts rewrote? Well, like, David. oops, he did it again. So in King v. Burl, which I think you were at the, uh, uh, you came with your daughter, which was very nice, to the uh, Supreme Court Roundup yesterday, um, the Chief Justice once again uh, read a statute, the Affordable Care Act, found that the plain text reading of the, law, of the law was strong, was forceful, but read the word state exchange to mean federal exchange because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So the Chief <laughs> Justice has done this twice to me, and he keeps breaking my heart. It's personal, but make them, he's doing this just for me, and this is the reason why he's doing it, screwing with me. Mostly kidding. Other questions about Obamacare? Uh, this is an important case, um, and not just because I'm your professor and I'm, I'm standing in front of you, but this was a significant case that really defines the current Supreme Court, and you'll be reading about this for years to come. This is a seriously important case. Yes, sir. Well, I just have a, I guess, I don't know if it's a philosophical question. Sure, go for it. So part of it is that the Supreme Court um, is not supposed to deal with legislative matters or political matters. It's supposed to deal with the legislative Okay. Mm -hmm. In, when, when the justice got nominated, it, it seemed to be more of a, he's going he's gonna to be more on this conservative side, and so things come up and, you need, you need to move it over or, or whatever, then this guy would say, say today. So it seems as if the nominations and, and appointments and those things are getting to be more and more partisan, more and more political. It seems as if he took a, a, a kind of stand that said, you know, I'm going to think this out the way that I need to think it out, you know, regardless of, of how it comes out in the watch. I mean, is that kind of maybe moving away from that, that kind of Ideas. So uh, the question, the question Mark asks, and it's a very fair question, reflects the Chief Justice's uh, confirmation hearing when he starts nominated back in 2005. This is actually the 10th anniversary of the Roberts Court. I think he was actually, this may be today or tomorrow will be the 10th anniversary of his, uh, of his confirmation, but I might be off by a day or two. Um, so I actually wrote an article recently in the Weekly Standard with, with uh, Randy Barnett, who I've mentioned a couple times, and uh, the title is The Next Justice, and this is a little bit more on the well, a little bit more on the, the non-academic side, uh, but looks at how the next Supreme Court justice can be nominated. And one of the interesting things about John Roberts is that he's what we call a little supreme. Okay, what do I mean by that? John Roberts basically lived his entire life to become a Supreme Court justice. Okay? He went out of his way at every single juncture to avoid making any statements that would complicate his confirmation. At every juncture, he avoided making any statements. Even his friends asked him, what do you think about affirmative action? Oh, man, he never said anything, right? He went through all ranks of government, always keeping things close to the vest, so that when it came to be a Supreme Court confirmation hearing, he just sailed through. He said, I'm like an umpire calling balls and strikes. But the problem with John Roberts, among other things, is that he never actually articulated what his vision of the Constitution is. He never had to. He avoided it. And it's become to the point, and this is my own observation, I'm a little bit going on a, on a, on a rant here, um, but his fidelity is often more to the Supreme Court than is the Constitution. Um, he venerates John Marshall, a person who we should not think that highly of because his most important decision was a mistake. Marbury should have never happened. He should have recused. Uh, uh, there was no jurisdiction, so don't write anything. Um, and John Roberts has a sense that He's playing this kind of big game where he can shape the court like a puppet master and guide it one way or the other. And I think that's tragically misguided. Uh, and he says, well, you know what? I'll rule in favor of Obamacare, then I'll strike in the Voting Rights Act. Let's even things out. But yeah, make, make it easy. Um, I think this is stupid uh, and, and very naive, and it suffers from a fatal conceit of arrogance uh, because no one can predict what will happen. And I think that judges should just take one case at a time, decide it here, whatever they think the best answer is, not jump through groups with saving constructions, distorting statutes, because of a fear. Because what's actually happened since the Obamacare decision, the popular opinion of the court has dropped significantly, uh, particularly among conservatives. His entire goal was to avoid the court from injecting itself into the election season. But if anyone watched the election, I'm sorry, the debate two weeks ago, what are they talking about? John Roberts and Obamacare. So the, uh, Obamacare and FIB create like a disturbance in the force, if you will, right? A glitch in the matrix, if I can use another expression, right? It shifted things and took a while for people to catch up. 
And I think the chief's decision will reverberate for quite some time. And, and uh, your Senator Ted Cruz has been very vocal, saying that we, we don't need any more John Robertses. And with respect, I've made a similar uh, point in this uh, argument, because um, as this image depicts, in 2017, Justin Ginsburg will be 83, Scalia will be 83, and Kennedy will be 80. So the next president may appoint one, two, three, maybe even four justices, uh, which is startling uh, of how much that can impact society. So this is something we should take uh, very seriously. Okay, the other uh, uh, answer to Mark's question is that we uh, no longer have a filibuster for the appointment of judges. So traditionally, you needed 60 votes to get a judge. This past uh, two years ago, the Senate Democrats eliminated the filibuster with something called the nuclear option. So now, instead of being 60, you need 51. The result of having 51 is indeed more partisan judges because you no longer need to compromise. You can get to the guy closest to your base, not someone who appeals to the moderates. So the direct result of getting rid of the filibuster is we will not have a 60 vote consensus. We'll have a 51 vote slide through. And I think the next justice will reflect that. I think that's the reality we are living in. Hope I answered your question in a roundabout way. Sorry, this is a, this is a hobby course I've been on for a while because uh, this is something I care very deeply about. Any other questions about Obamacare? Let's see if. Very quickly, um, that might be looked at this the wrong way, but like the Commerce Clause that they have expanded it and eventually ran into the Lopez case. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the Obamacare case is a similar expansion to the taxation clause. Mm. So, is there a so, so, really, um, I think the way to view Obamacare in terms of was it Lopez, was it Raich, was it going backwards or forward, I think Obamacare held the line. I used a phrase last week, this far but no farther, right? It's a listen, we already went as far as we're going to go in Wickard. We're not going to allow Congress to regulate inactivity. We're not going to allow Congress to mandate people engage in activity. We're not going that far. The taxing power, though, if you read the chief's opinion, we have opinions going back to the 1800s where they said you can regulate stuff in the state even if it doesn't cross state lines, right? Even if it's not activity. The only rub is how you read a statute that says it's not a tax to be a tax. That, that's where the Chief Justice, in my mind, jumped the entire sea world. Not just a shark, but the entire theme park. Yeah. Good. Mm. Well, there, there were also other cases about tax people do bad stuff or tax people don't do stuff, right? Uh, for example, you know, let me ask you like this. If you install efficient windows in your home, you get a tax credit, right? If you don't install efficient windows, you're paying more taxes. A tax credit is effectively not taxing you and taxing someone else, right? We get all the time taxed for not doing things the government wants us to do, even if we're doing nothing. So if I do nothing, my tax bill is higher than you who installed efficient windows. That's my hand somewhere over here. Oh, I just actually had a question. That I hadn't really completely understood it, but the, like the nuclear option you're talking about for uh, judges. Is there any way for the Senate to reinstitute the filibuster? Or oh, Lord, no, no, no. This is a new world we're living in. Okay. Yeah, no, I actually, I was actually had a note with Senator Cornyn recently. I asked him that question. He's like, no, we'll stay where we are, which I think is a wise one. Yes, ma'am. I had uh, gotten one of those notices that you said about people being dropped from their insurance, and it says it'll change. What effect did the case have on, like, why are, you know what I'm saying? Why are your policies being canceled? So the Affordable Care Act, among other things, requires minimum essential coverage. What that means is cheap plans don't cover a lot are no longer valid. If you have a cheap plan, you have to still pay the mandate. So insurance companies no longer offer them. The reason why millions of plans were canceled during the fall of 2014 was because of Obamacare. Obamacare said all these old, cheap plans, which are not very good coverage, are no longer valid. So that's why the plans were canceled. Sorry. No, I mean, it says that at the end of this year, and it said, I can do another one. But then you lose your grandfather status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People, I mean, it, it, so last Obamacare comment, I'll move on. So one thing you have to be aware of going forward is something called the Cadillac tax, which I don't know if you've actually read about. But the Cadillac tax basically says if you have a generous plan, basically if your insurance, if your, if your employer provides basically almost all of your costs, like 
thank God at South Texas, I don't pay very much for my insurance. The law school has very good benefits for the employees, right? Um, if you have a very generous policy starting in 2018, there'll be a 40% excise tax placed on it. No one will pay for it. I'm going to lose my insurance about two years, so it will happen. I, I already talked to HR, it's going to be, go away. This will affect millions and millions of people in America. Because one of the ways that Obamacare was supposed to be budget neutral was basically by taxing to death very generous policies to get people off their generous policies onto the Obamacare exchanges, put more money into the system. We're already seeing the first fractures in the Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton have now opposed the Cadillac tax, and they still have to pay for it somewhere else by taxing other people. Uh, but once you eliminate the Cadillac tax, the entire Obamacare thing goes to a massive deficit spiral because there's nothing paying for all the generous subsidies. This will hit in about two years. Whoever is in the White House will have to deal with this mess. It's not going to be easy. Okay, and there are last Obamacare question. Then we'll move on to the 14th Amendment. Just uh, I teach entire class in this case. It's it's well, yeah. So that was part of the justification for the taxing was I mean that it wasn't a penalty was that you know it wasn't affecting very drastically. And Obama also specifically didn't say if you like your plan you can keep it. Right. So yeah. So I mean, that, 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 okay. So we'll, I'll stop there. That was an abject lie because he, the way Obamacare works is by kicking people off their expensive plants onto cheaper plants. I mean that, that that's how the law works. And in mm -hmm. fact, various regulations were implemented to make it harder to grandfather your plants, make it easier to be thrown off. I have an entire chapter in my book about this, which I'll maybe share with you at some point later. Fourteenth Amendment. Okay. So we finished the first half of the class, which is a fitting point for your midterm, I suppose. We've gone through all the structural provisions of the Constitution. We've gone through the powers of the executive, the powers of the legislative, we've gone the taxing power, the commerce power, uh, the spending power. We've all done so far what's known as the powers of government, the structure of government. We move on now to what's often called the rights provisions of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment. The First Amendment, the Second Amendment, okay? But I want to pause here very briefly. In a lot of law schools, there are two separate common law classes. There's a class on structure and there's a class on rights. In fact, if you buy the review books, you usually split up like that. Um, I think that entire distinction is a misnomer. It's misleading. Because as we've discussed at great length, it is the structural provisions of our Constitution that protect freedom, not the Bill of Rights. And Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in FIV makes this very clear. We often think that the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, or where freedoms are at, no, 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 no. It's what limits the government, which is what keeps us free. So the limits on numerated powers, the limit on the Commerce Clause, the Tenth Amendment. Limitations on government is what promotes liberty, right? But the Fourteenth Amendment does so explicitly. So let me go through a little bit of history first. So um, when we discuss the original Constitution, what do you know about that? The Constitution of 1787, ratified in 1789. This document made a number of assumptions about how government works. And we've read this in the Federalist. The thinking was that if we have stronger protection for states' rights, that states will afford greater protections for individual liberty. Unfortunately, the first 70 or so years of our republic proved that not to be the case. And I am speaking specifically of the institution known as slavery. Okay? The hope was when our constitution was ratified that even through economic pressure or moral pressure, slavery would stop. It would cease. The constitution says we won't touch the slave trade until 1805. It was eliminated shortly thereafter. But one of the aspects of eliminating the slave trade was it made the actual uh, 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 propagation of a, 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 a slave estates in various states were necessary because you couldn't replenish slaves. As a result, you had a stark divide. In the southern agrarian, the southern farm states, slavery became an essential attribute of their economic success. Indeed, the states couldn't even exist without that workforce held in chains. The northern states, and I'm talking like above Maryland. Maryland was a slave state. So, I mean, there, that's why the Mason-Dixon line is right there. The northern states became virulently anti-slavery. And we effectively had a nation 
divided in a way that's very difficult to think of today. As, as, as much as red states and blue states hate each other, our nation was quite divided. And this divide spilled not just to the states, but to the territories. As each new territory was added to the nation, there was a bitter, bitter dispute over whether that territory would become a slave, a slave, a slave state or a free state. Indeed, the Dred Scott decision, which you'll study at some point, I think next week or, or, or thereafter, the Dred Scott decision involved the status, status of whether new territories new territory become three states. Three states. And the decision by Chief Justice Tani, he wrote that slavery is a property right, and the government cannot deprive people of their property interests and their slaves. That the uh, government cannot make a territory a free state, uh, and we'll discuss that some length later. Okay, but eventually this all came to a head with the Civil War, or as perhaps some people call it the War of Northern Aggression, which I, I chuckled the first time I heard that. Um, the Civil War has many causes, and there are more government teachers and history teachers can talk about that in the room, but I am more interested in what happened after the Civil War. So what happened after the Civil War. The American Congress was basically fractured. All of the southern states lost their representation in the Congress. They had none. Virtually every southern state was put under federal supervision in a period known as Reconstruction. They were literally reconstructing or rebuilding the southern states. So you had federal generals from the Union Army sitting over the governorship of various states. The purpose of this was to try to build a country back from ruins. At the time, the southern states were all Democratic, and the northern states, like Abraham Lincoln, were Republicans. I don't make this as a, as a political point, but once you eliminate the southern states, you have a super duper majority of Republicans in the Congress. These were all known as the radical Republicans, if you remember from your high school civics. And the radical Republicans were actually um, quite radical of laws and in constitutional amendments that changed our country forever. So when we speak of the framers of our Constitution, we often think of James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. But indeed, you need to add the framers of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. People like uh, 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 Jacob Howard, right? And, and John Bingham. These are people you've probably never heard of. But they were instrumental in drafting the amendments that uh, changed and shifted and altered the balance between the central government and the states. This experiment of leaving the states under their own supervision didn't quite pan out. So the Reconstruction Amendment shifted authority back to the central government to ensure that the states protect certain civil rights. Okay. Any questions so far? So the first, actually the first, but the, the, the first Reconstruction Amendment is the 13th Amendment, which I have up here. And the 13th Amendment is unique because it is the first provision of the Constitution to apply to private individuals. Slavery was not a problem of just the government. Slavery was a problem of slave masters owning human beings and treating them as property, as chattel. The 13th Amendment reads, not no state shall make a law affecting slavery. No, 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 no. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. That means anywhere. Any person who holds someone in slavery or involuntary servitude that act is now unconstitutional. So believe it or not, you actually have cases like this today involving human trafficking. This exists. It's a form of 
involuntary servitude. If you hold someone against their will and force them to work in prostitution, whatever it happens to be, that's slavery. Just as important as Section 1 of the 13th Amendment is Section 2. It says, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So we've discussed before that all of Congress's powers appear in Section 1. I'm sorry, Article 1, Section 8. Remember, it lists all the powers. They can do commerce and tax and post offices, right? The Reconstruction Amendments expand the scope of Congress's powers. No longer are they limited to Article 1, Section 8. But now they have Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. And they can enact appropriate legislation. Appropriate legislation to enforce the 13th Amendment. So I'll give you an example, a law that even exists today. We have federal hate crime legislation, right? Federal hate crime legislation, which basically criminalizes certain what are called hate crimes. That law is actually justified under Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. That Congress determined that uh, the vestiges of slavery exist today with, federal, uh, uh, with hate crimes, right? And they can actually punish and criminalize acts that are purely intrastate because of the history of slavery. <coughs> that statute is probably un unconstitutional, but we'll get to that in a few minutes why. But they do have these laws today. Okay. Any question on the 13th Amendment? We'll get back to it in a few minutes. We did the civil rights case later today. Any question on the 13th? I'm just trying to give it a high-level overview. So the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865. And the purpose of the 13th Amendment was just that, to get rid of slavery. But the framers realized that it wasn't sufficient just to take a man's chains off. That it was also necessary to take action, dare I say affirmative action, to assist the freedmen and to prevent the states from oppressing them. So shortly after the 13th Amendment, this happened pretty early on, the black codes emerged in a number of states. And these were laws that attempted to um, recreate the circumstances of slavery um, as closely as possible by saying that blacks couldn't own property, that they couldn't serve on juries, that they couldn't make contracts, that they couldn't bear arms. The Ku Klux Klan hated armed blacks. That was a very dangerous thing for them. In fact, there's a serious history. Uh, oh, by the way, you know what the first gun control law was passed in the country? You know what state? Georgia. Why? Disarm blacks. You don't want someone armed, you want to lynch. There's a serious history of gun control that emerged as a way to disarm free slaves. This was a, a scourge. So the Congress recognized they had all these southern states enacting these laws, which took away every <clears throat> conceivable civil right. And although these people were not, they were not slave in name, in the absence of any rights, they were effectively slaves once again. So Congress acts and, 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 and passes a momentous law called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This is a very significant act. The act, among other things, made everyone in the United States who was born in the United States a citizen. It protected the rights of people, regardless of color, to make contracts, to sue and be sued, to give testimony in court, to inherit property, to purchase property, to sell property. It guaranteed basically the full protection of the law, regardless of your color. This was a very ambitious statute. President Andrew Johnson vetoed it. Okay. The Congress overrode the veto. But there was a serious question here. Could Congress accomplish all of these things by statute? Could Congress force the states by statute to protect and give civil rights to the freedmen. By the way, when I say freedmen, uh, women as well, but it was a term for to the freed, the freed slaves. So could they give these rights to the freedmen? 
Indeed, when President Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, he said there's no way this is possible, this is unconstitutional. He was a Southern sympathizer, too, and he would get impeached in about two years. We discussed when we did the Tenure of Office Act. Remember, he was impeached because he tried to fire the Secretary of War? This, this was a very radical time. You can imagine that the president's vetoing civil rights acts. It was very, uh, very difficult. So there was a serious question over whether the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was constitutional. I don't think it was. But the members, the Radican, uh, the Radican, the Radical Republicans in Congress said, okay, we need to amend the Constitution once again. We need to put this in the Constitution in stone. Why? Because they feared once the southern states reamassed their power, they were admitted back to the Union. They sent members to Washington. They would repeal the statute. If you put something in a statute, a statute would be repealed. <coughs> and they were afraid that once the southern states rose again, the statute would be repealed. So you want to make this permanent and put an amendment to the Constitution to solidify the civil rights of all persons. Also, by the way, they realized you needed fewer states to ratify. Even though you need three-fourths of the states to ratify, southern states didn't count yet. Also, a number of the southern states, their admission to the Union was contingent on ratifying the 14th Amendment. I said again, a number of states would not be admitted back to the Union unless they ratify the 14th Amendment. So they basically had enough states. One funny note, if I remember correctly, Mississippi ratified the 15th Amendment like in 1990-something. Apparently, a student was doing some research in the archives, and uh, he or she discovered that Mississippi never ratified the 15th Amendment. So that was ratified. You know about this? Yeah. Was it that late? Okay. No, they started in 95. Okay, good, yeah. They left out one provision or something, and it wasn't until the movie came out. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Okay, bingo, yeah. Okay, I, I was off by 20 years. But yes. So basically, a number of Southern states hadn't even ratified the 15th Amendment guaranteeing suffrage to uh, regardless of color until, you know, two years ago. By the way, did anyone see the movie Lincoln? I didn't like it. I was so broken hearted. Like, there's a movie about the Constitution, and I just, it was boring. I, I really didn't like it. I, I, re I really wanted to like it, and I just, like, I couldn't. It was, it was poorly made. There were very inaccuracies. I was, nothing. But we got the 14th Amendment, okay? And the 14th Amendment, and then one of the lead drafters, a guy named John Bingham, uh, a representative from Ohio, whose name you don't know, but you should know. The 14th Amendment has five sections, and I want to walk you through them um, one bit at a time, because it accomplishes so much in so few words. You look at a thing like the Affordable Care Act, it's 3,000 pages, you know. Uh, uh, they were a little bit simpler back then, and the, the sorts of phrases. So first, the problem to be remedied was this. Before the 14th Amendment, citizenship was a matter of state law. There was nothing in the Constitution about who becomes a citizen. It was a matter of state law. <coughs> what did the Constitution say now? We don't trust the states to grant citizenship. We don't trust them. Indeed, virtually all of the people born to slavery, to bondage, were not citizens. Therefore, they were entitled to no rights. You'll recall in Article 4, there's a Privileges and Immunities Clause. Right? If you go to your, I'm not wearing my coat, but if you go to your uh, Constitution, Article 4, there's your Privileges and Immunities Clause. It's page, uh, page 17, right? I don't have it up here, but I forgot. So Article 4, Section 2. It says, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to the privileges and immunities in the several states. And I explained this phrase, privileges and immunities, refer to certain rights. Now, there were many slaves who said, wait a minute, I'm a citizen. I get all these privileges and immunities that can go between different states. I can, I can be free. And the Supreme Court held, and Dred Scott, no, you are not a citizen. And because you are not a citizen, you do not get these privileges and immunities. Right? That's the history. So look at what the 14th Amendment does very clearly. It begins, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof 
are citizens of the United States. If you were born here, I'll, I'll get to the Donald Trump question in a minute. If you were born here and you are subject to the jurisdiction thereof, you are a citizen. And because you're a citizen, you then get the privileges or immunities of citizenship. That by virtue of your citizenship, states can no longer deprive you or abridge these privileges or immunities of citizenship. That first part that I just read fixed, fixed the Article 4 issue. That the, that the slaves, that the freedmen, were not deemed citizens by their own state. So now as state, they're entitled to this entire uh, a, 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 a host of privileges and immunities. And when we, do, when we do slaughterhouse, I'll explain what those privileges and immunities are. But these are generally a set of various rights that are protected. What they are, slaughterhouse, slaughter them. Okay. Now, it's come back, comes back every couple of years. Birthright citizenship, right? So let me start with, with this supposition. As the law stands today, um, under congressional law, if a person is born in the United States, they are a citizen by birth, regardless of the citizenship or the alienage of their parents. And that's been the law for quite some time. The Supreme Court has held as much that by virtue of the laws, people are born as citizens. There is, though, a question over what this phrase, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, means. And here, there's a debate, uh, which I will not even step foot into, but I'll try to explain my best as I can what the different sides are. More likely than not, what the framers were considering were the children of ambassadors. Okay? If you are the child of an ambassador, or you're the child of a king, and you're born here, you are subject to a foreign jurisdiction, right? You are subject to a foreign jurisdiction. That's more likely than not what they're considering. Likewise, Indians. If you are a member of an Indian tribe, you are actually subject to the, tr the, the jurisdiction of your tribe that you belong to, okay? So has this worked? Well, it'll be called birth tourism, which, 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 which is a, you know, it, it, it exists, perhaps not in great numbers, but it exists, right? Unclear. Okay, because the framers were almost not certainly thinking of people who came here for the sole purpose of having children citizens. Now, however rare it is, that was likely not on the minds of the framers of the 14th Amendment. Um, indeed, there, there, there has been pro uh, proposals to actually have a statute to uh, stop birthright citizenship. Um, you know, if you read the debates of the 14th Amendment, no one was talking about uh, 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 birth uh, tourism. That wasn't an issue. But if we start from the supposition that words have meaning, and what does it mean to be subject to the jurisdiction thereof? Is a child born to citizens of a foreign nation subject to their jurisdiction? I'm not giving you an answer. Uh, but the short answer is that the Supreme Court has not finally resolved this, and the debates are not 100% conclusive. Um, and the policy matters I really don't even want to touch. But, but that is uh, about all I'm going to say about that. Questions? All right. So anyone born here, is a citizen, and by virtue of being a citizen, you get the privileges or immunities of citizenship. The amendment continues in section one. There's so much in there. The first part up to here talks about citizens. Second part talks about persons, not citizens, but persons. And again, not men persons, which is actually quite salient later, okay? It says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is a verbatim quote from the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment has a due process clause that you cannot deprive some of their life of your property. But the biggest difference, the biggest difference is that now it's no state. In the past, the federal government cannot deprive you of property. Now, the state cannot. Yeah. So, so actually, the better example is Guam. If you are born in Guam, you are not a citizen by birth. And there's actually a, or is it American Samoa? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, Samoa. Samoa. I'm sorry. Yeah, like like girls have cookies, right? Um, if you're born there. You are not a citizen by constitutional birth. There's actually a case, a friend of mine is litigating it now about that exact issue. 
uh, there were these cases called the the uh, the insular cases decided around 1900, give or take a few years, were effectively, and these cases were pretty uh, uh, xenophobic, said that people born in these uh, countries are not worthy of our race and they do not get birthright citizenship. Yeah, oh, these cases are really interesting when you read the uh, the cases of birthright citizenship. They get really, really uh, uh, jarring by today's standards. That's still good law, by the way. Um, so that's due process. The final guarantee says, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Okay? So there are the three key components of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. There is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. There is the Due Process Clause. And there is the Equal Protection Clause. These are the three main core components of the 14th Amendment, Section Number 1. By the way, privileges or immunities. In Article 4, it's privileges and immunities. In the 14th Amendment, it's privileges or immunities. Don't get them mixed up. Even law professors get them mixed up. It drives me crazy. And the way to remember that is Article 4 comes first. It's A, privileges and immunities. And the 14th Amendment comes second. It's privileges O, O comes later in the alphabet, or immunities. Make sure I get that right. It's a little pet peeve of mine. Now, when the 14th Amendment was being debated and, and, and drafted, the most important provision was often called the gem of the Constitution was the Privileges or Immunities Clause. It's even indeed listed first. This was meant to do all of the heavy lifting in the Constitution. This was meant to be the, the fountainhead, if you will, of our rights. This was like the font of freedom. But as you'll read in the Slaughterhouse case, the Supreme Court effectively gutted the Privileges or Immunities Clause. They said it doesn't really mean anything, has to limit a bunch of stupid rights that don't matter, whatever. As a result of the Supreme Court's premature strangling in the crib of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the court has shifted to the other two provisions, due process and equal protection. Often separate, and as we read the gay marriage case, sometimes they're combined. But those have been the, uh, the, the source of the Supreme Court's rights and jurisprudence over the last, you know, hundred and so years. Okay, any questions on section one? We'll do this a lot more detail, but I want to just run through. Okay. Section two is interesting. No one ever reads this far, right? Section one effectively repealed the three-fifths clause, right? How did section one repeal the three-fifths three clause? Is that everyone who's born here is a citizen, period. You're not a fraction of a citizen, you are a citizen. Done, right? What about Section 2? What if a state continued to deprive a person of their full suffrage? I'm sorry, of their full representation in Congress? We can get to voting that later. What effectively happens is, if a state does not give full representation based on, uh, uh, based on a person, Congress reduces their representation. In other words, if you deprive black people representation, you lose members of Congress. So it's almost a reverse three-fifths, right? You're actually losing representation if you treat people as less than a full person. And this was meant to ensure um, that, that the states didn't just, you know, call them the citizens but not count them for representation. Okay. Okay. Section three of the 13th Amendment, it's kind of a 14th Amendment, it's interesting. If you engage in insurrection or rebellion, you can't serve in Congress. This was creating a qualification for, for representation. In other words, Congress did not want to admit a bunch of former Confederate generals. For the exact reason, they didn't want them repealing all their laws. And they, they put it right there. If you engage <laughs> in insurrection or rebellion, you can find another job. Okay. Section four is interesting. No one ever reads this far. Section four is interesting. So there are a couple provisions, right? The debt of the United States shall not be questioned, right? So what happens if any debt was uh, uh, suffered, like a southern state incurred a debt during the war? They have to pay it. This provision, no one ever reads, but this one's interesting. So when we talk a bit about Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, all studied uh, uh, in, in high school at some point, right? 
So the Emancipation Proclamation did not free all the slaves. It didn't. It only purported to free the slaves in the southern states in rebellion. How did Lincoln free the slaves? If we needed a 13th Amendment to eliminate slavery, how can the president, by effectively executive order, he had a pen and, oh, he never a phone, but he had a pen, right? How could the president eliminate slavery in the southern states? This one's going to blow your mind, okay? At the time, slaves were deemed property, okay? As the commander-in-chief of the military, the president concedes rebel property. The same way that the, that the general can seize a bridge or a factory or a warehouse, President Lincoln seized the slaves, at which point he immediately freed them. He emancipated them because once a slave is your property, you can emancipate them. That's what's called the Emancipation Proclamation. So Lincoln's freeing of the slaves was actually an act of treating them as property and then freeing them. Blows your mind, right? But what happens when the government takes your property? What must they do? Compensation. Just compensation. So read Section 4 of the 13th Amendment. Neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred or any claim for the loss of emancipation of any slave. What's that saying? We don't have to pay for taking your slaves. Isn't that something, right? That this 14th Amendment says, we took all of your slaves just in case some court says that that was a taking and the federal government needs to compensate for the freeing of millions of slaves. We ain't paying for it. Isn't that something, right? I mean, there's so much in the 14th Amendment that most people never even bother reading about. But, you know, they, they thought of just about everything. It's, it's actually insane, uh, the amount of effort they put into this. We, you know, we can't even pass a law that's established by the state and established by the federal government. We can't even go that far. So uh, uh, that's part. Now, in class for, I guess, Wednesday, you'll focus on Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. This is what's called the enforcement power. So you have Section 2 of the 13th Amendment as you have Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. And it effectively says the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. This becomes a very controversial provision because it basically gives Congress the power to tell states what to do. If a state is depriving someone of life, liberty, or property, Congress can pass a law to stop them. If a state official is not giving someone due process, Congress can create Section 1983, which allows them to get sued. Are right, you studying this, 1983? That is directly because of this. In fact, it was originally called the Ku Klux Klan Act, that you can sue a state official as depriving your civil rights. All these attributes where people sue their states and the, the, the states have to do this or that, that comes straight from Section 5. We mentioned the Violence Against Women Act, where you could sue your state. That comes from Section 5. Well, the court held that was unconstitutional for reasons we'll discuss uh, 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 in a couple weeks. Any questions? I realize I'm lecturing a lot tonight. The reading was very dense, so I'll probably do a little more lecturing than usual. So I want to make sure I get through everything. Yes, ma'am. There are still other limits, though, with, with the Tenth Amendment. So even uh, we'll do the Voluntary Women Act case weeks ago, but because of the pretty state sovereignty, even money will get you there. Can't buy you love, right? So, so uh, let's talk about the slaughterhouse cases for a minute. And this is a case that's very near and dear to my heart uh, for reasons that will make no sense. Um, uh, when the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was being debated, I mentioned that one of the rights that was being pr uh, protected is what's often called the right to contract. Okay, This is the idea that you should have a right to earn an honest living and pursue the vocation of your choice. Okay. Um, this is a right which, which people today don't think much about. Uh, but during the framing period of the 14th Amendment, it was very much the idea that if you were a freed slave and you had a skill, you should be able to work in that job. And the state should not be allowed to pass a law to restrict access to that job. Because once they restrict access to your job, 
you can't afford to pay for your family's meals, and then you go in the poorhouse and you become a sharecropper. So the idea of free labor, and there's a you know huge debate about this. I won't even touch it. But this was a, a, a very strong sentiment during the ratification period of the 14th Amendment. So what happens? You come to the slaughterhouse cases. This is actually a, a wood cutting of the New Orleans slaughterhouse. Um, what effectively happened in the case is this. The city of New Orleans created a monopoly. They said, you are no longer allowed to slaughter animals in your own place of business. You are required to slaughter them in this single, the Crescent City slaughterhouse. We see these long rows. I mean, it looks very pretty here, but they're probably covered with blood and probably smelled like uh, uh, really bad stuff, right? What happened if you had a butcher shop in town? Well, you're now out of business because a monopoly, a cartel, was given. Like the same way too, if we have taxis and Uber, right, you know, they have a, a centralized cartelized uh, a slaughterhouse. So what authority must the state rely on to build this sort of a slaughterhouse? Well, it's, of course, the police power, right? They say we have to protect the health and the safety and welfare of the people. And, you know, we don't want people having these dirty butcher shops. People get sick. So we'll have this one clean, sterile, massive, gargantuan, you know, slaughterhouse where, the, you know, the, the lambs go silent and, you know, everything's awesome. So before the 14th Amendment was ratified, were there any limits on the state's police power? And the short answer is no. There may have been some limits under the, uh, 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 under the um, what do you call it, Article 1, Section 9. They can't pass the Bill of Attainder, right? They can't impair contracts, right? But before the 14th Amendment was ratified, there were virtually no limits in the state police power. Indeed, this is how slavery rose up. What about, Josh, what about the First Amendment? What about the Second Amendment? What's the first word in the First Amendment? Congress. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Indeed, up until this point, the Bill of Rights did not apply. We'll discuss this later. But the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states of the 20th century. So virtually speaking, the states had a limited authority to do whatever the heck they wanted. The 14th Amendment, in my opinion, was designed to alter that balance and alter that calculus. <clears throat> So in the slaughterhouse cases, a suit was brought alleging that this monopoly, this, this, this beef monopoly, right, violated the 14th Amendment. It violated the 14th Amendment's privileges or immunities clause. And in short, the litigants argued that this violates our right to earn an honest living, our right to pursue the vocation of our choice. If I want to be a butcher, I don't need to deal with this stupid monopoly, right? In the slaughterhouse cases, the court effectively gutted the clause. They reduced the clause to an absolute and utter nullity. Okay? The majority opinion by Justice Miller um, says that the state's police power was not modified by the 14th Amendment, okay? And what's interesting about the analysis here is how they read the Reconstruction Congress. So remember, the 13th and 14th Amendments came about because of a bloody, divisive civil war, brother against brother shooting one another, right? Although the war was about slavery, the language of the 14th Amendment is indeed much broader. It doesn't speak in terms of skin color. It speaks of persons. It doesn't say men. It doesn't say women. It says persons. And it doesn't just say, yeah, blacks are equal to whites. It says people guarantee the equal protection of the law. They can't be denied due process. They get these privileges or immunities, these rights. So rather than reading the Constitution with an eye towards these broad expanse of rights, the majority opinion strangles the clause in its crib, in its infancy. Okay. And they said the purpose of this constitution was really just to get rid of slavery. Basically just, you know, get rid of slavery, nothing much else. It didn't change the law. He says the pervading purpose is the freedom of the slave race. That's it. 
So then what are these privileges or immunities of citizenship? The court reads them so, so narrowly. Not the right to acquire and possess property or to pursue happiness and safety at any cost, right? What are they? He puts together a list of rights that are included. He says the right to demand protection of the government on the high seas, the right to use the navigable waters of the United States, the right to access sub-treasuries of the government, I'm not joking. You can read them. He lists them. The majority opinion seems to believe that we fought a bloody civil war so that freed slaves can claim protections in the high seas, so that they can access the sub-treasuries and the seaports of the country, so they can access courts of justice, and they can use the navigable waters of the United States. This is a farce. And I don't just say this because I don't like it. This is an opinion which virtually every constitutional law scholar, left, right, and middle, center, agrees was wrong. Um, the court took a clause that was meant to provide expanse protection for liberty and crumpled a little ball of paper and said, no, nope, it doesn't really mean anything. We didn't fight a civil war over access to the sub-treasuries, if you will. Okay. So the slaughterhouse case, although it's best remembered for you know being one of the first expositions of the 14th Amendment, truly stands for a Supreme Court that disregarded what had just happened. They were not interested in giving any meaning to this law. Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, was this at the same time uh, Democrats were still holding the power in the Supreme Court? So the Slaughterhouse case thing was like 1870-something, you want to have a year? 1873. 1873. So we're talking now five years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And at that point, a number of southern states had started creeping their way back in. Indeed, this law that was passed by the Crescent City had serious racial overtones uh, and was meant to basically consolidate with one, you know, crony favorite butcher all the uh, slaughtering in that town. I'll get to the dissent in a second. Any question on justice, justice uh, uh, majority? Yeah. What? I had a question on that. Go for it. Yeah, ask a question. Um, I just don't see the difference between this and any other you know, uh, state government regulation, regulating any of this. You know, they saw a bunch of slocketing in the water and they wanted to stop it. I mean, they tried to different means to do it, but I mean, it mm. still happens today. So, two answers, right? So, first, today we take regulation for granted, right? Virtually every aspect of your life is regulated in ways that you don't even have. That was not the case in 1873. Or by a large swath, people had an autonomy to do what they wish. But the second answer is let's say it either was a health condition, right? Is there a way for the state to eliminate health problems short of shutting up every butcher shop in town? No. They just regulate whatever the, whatever the problem is. I mean, it's, if it's blood getting into the water stream and you bring up ventilation that stops blood from getting into the water. Right. So Mark, Mark raises an important issue, right? There's always two ways to skin a cat. There's two ways to skin a cat. If indeed the problem was sanitation, how about you have health inspectors? How about you have sanitation codes? Instead, what this did was it shut down every butcher shop in town. In fact, Justice Field calls this a, quote, naked case. What does it mean by naked case? This is an act of protectionism. This is a cartel. This is meant to create a monopoly for this one company and put out of business every other butcher shop in town. So indeed, states, of course, do have latitude, right? Well, the dissent does say, like, wait a minute. Let's look under the hood, right? Let's just not take health, safety, and welfare as a final authority. Let's actually understand what's going on. This is a beginning of a discussion what's often called substantive due process, the idea that the courts can actually check various economic regulations. And in the case of Lochner, which we'll study later, this becomes a very divisive element because this entire idea of second-guessing regulation cuts against a progressive state that wants to regulate everything for the health. Caleb. And this might be difficult to follow because I'm a little confused. But sure. First, it seems that the, I mean, the 14th Amendment drastically alters the relationship between the state and the federal government. 
Yes, sir. Um, in that the federal government not has more power over what the states can or cannot do. And the courts. And, and, the, and, the, and the courts as well. So, Miller here, I mean, the whole purpose that I think that that wasn't included was, of course, local government is, is relatable to the people. They can make changes if the government does something they don't want them to do. Or at least that's the idea, I think. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it seems that Miller is two things here. One, I thought that he was reading it way too narrowly and basically saying that this is that it's just about freeing slaves. That's what was happening at the time, and that's really the only purpose. And it doesn't apply to the butchers in Louisiana, right? But then secondly, he's kind of saying that if the butchers in Louisiana want to change that, then it's their job to change the local government, not our place to step in. Good. So Caleb's question reflects the ongoing debate of whether the 14th Amendment gives courts supervision over state authority. And this becomes a serious question because in the early 20th century, states began invalidating minimum wage laws, maximum hour laws, health and safety laws, saying that those are not consistent with due process, right? We only study cases of but there are also state labor laws saying that these state labor laws are inconsistent with due process of law. Judge, uh, uh, the majority of Judge Miller is saying, we should not, courts, be taking on this responsibility. If the people don't like these laws, let them change it themselves. And you're exactly right, that's what the majority opinion says. Let's try to hand some of the back. Lindsay, was your hand? Oh, I did. Well, I'm just You sure? And? Okay. So the dissent, though, by Justice Field. Justice Field says, look, this is a naked case of protectionism, right? We don't have to be economists to understand that this is an act meant to punish all the butchers and reward the preferred butcher with favors. Okay. Uh, Justice uh, Field uh, basically says that the 13th Amendment, right, the way the court read it, is absolutely implausible. There's no way that this is the correct way of reading the Constitution. And that the states have limitations. He writes, it will be, quote, a vain and idle enactment. The 14th Amendment would be a vain and idle enactment if all the Constitution protects is access to sub-treasuries. And like Caleb said, other silly, stupid rights. So what are these privileges or immunities? Okay. He cites the Civil Rights Act of 1866. He says includes the right to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties and give evidence, to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold and convey real and personal property, and to the full and equal application, sorry, the full and equal benefits of the law. He says like this, in 1866, Congress passed this bill, and then two years later, they ratified an amendment. Shouldn't this bill be an indication of what they were talking about, that the same sort of privileges or immunities are now? Effectively, privileges or immunities is a term of art. It's like an abbreviation. Instead of putting this entire list of sell property, contracts, just say PRI. Just get in there quickly. He writes, the privileges or immunities are those which of right belong to citizens of free governments. He says includes the right to pursue lawful employment in a lawful manner. Okay. The, pursuit of a, the pursuit of a vocation, a job. Right? And he says, this is the inalienable right of every free citizen to pursue his happiness. Sandra. So how does he justify what he's saying? Oh, I'm not there. Give me five minutes. I can, I, can I call you that for one, please? Thank you. I, I'll get there. I'll get there in about five. Question two different ways. Okay. We'll discuss in about two weeks a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, which involves segregated train cars. And uh, it's very easy to sit back and look, you know, and think, point, and think oh my god, that was terribly wrong, right? But what do you think would have happened if they were said with Plessy, hey Louisiana, go desegregate your train cars now? What do you think would have happened in 1890, whatever the year was? One of the damn thing. So there's something to be said, I'm not defending this, but there's something to be said of courts not issuing orders that will be ignored. Right? We discussed this with James Marshall, uh, J uh, uh, John Marshall, the very first week of class. If he told Jefferson to go give the guy his, 
commissioned. Jeff Smoot said, no way. So lurking in the background perhaps is a reticence of the court saying, let's not get telling these southern states where the Klan is basically running the capital what to do because they're going to ignore us. And that's going to make us look bad. We'll get to when we do a Dred Scott, I'm sorry, Plessy in a, in a couple of classes, but I think that partially, partially hints at your, your answer. Okay. Uh, the other dissents by Justice Bradley makes the same point, that the right of pursuing an honest vocation is part of the Constitution. He even cites Magna Carta, uh, and he lists these various rights. Okay. So a privilege or immunity is clause is interesting. Um, even though the court basically read it out of existence in 18, was it 73, in the year 2010, it came back to the Supreme Court in a decision called McDonald v. City of Chicago. This was a case considering whether the right to bear arms applies in the state. So, in 2008, in a case called District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms. But that was only affecting the federal government, the District of Columbia. Did the right extend to the states? So we'll discuss this later, but I'll mention it now. There are two paths through which rights can be incorporated to the states. The first, and the one that the Supreme Court adopts, is called substantive due process. So we have here this phrase, as life liberty or property. States can't deprive you of life, liberty, or property. What does liberty mean? The Supreme Court has said, summarizing, that the amendments to the Bill of Rights is liberty. And the states cannot deprive you of a liberty interest that's listed in the Bill of Rights. That this word liberty has a substance to it that includes those rights in the Bill of Rights. Apparently now also includes the right to get married. Mazel tov, right? So there are a series of rights, some enumerated, some unenumerated, that are included. But the better route, and I say this as an advocate a little bit, the better route through which to extend the Second Amendment to the states is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Why? Because the Civil Rights Act of 1866 specifically said the right to bear arms, remember the slaves being disarmed? The right to bear arms is something the states cannot deprive you of. Right? And actually my colleague, Alan Gura, who I'm actually uh, litigating a case with now, uh, argued to the Supreme Court that the Privileges or Immunities Clause was the right way to protect the right to bear arms, that states should not be able to take away uh, gun rights because of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Um, only Justice Thomas accepted that argument, and he accepted it in full with a very uh, a scholarly opinion. Uh, the other justices basically said, yeah, whatever, that's a nice clause, we're not going to deal with it. Uh, the, the majority opinion said, yeah, there's probably some good stuff with Privileges or Immunities, but let's not rock the boat, let's keep things the way they are. So unfortunately, with the exception of Justice Thomas, as is often the case, uh, the court has ignored an entire clause of the Constitution. All right, any questions? Yeah. Just to say what you just said, <laughs> so that's Yeah. It, it came up in 1873. Yeah. And then we see it again in a couple of cases we're about to talk about. Yeah. And then we don't see it again until 2010. Yeah. It, it comes up in a couple of dissents along the way, but for the most part, nothing. It basically, once Slaughterhouse happens, a clause just goes away. Bradwell, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it goes away, which is a, which is a damn shame. Yeah, in fact, I'd, I'd be remiss to mention, actually, so in the, um, uh, there was actually a, a lawyer in D.C. He actually died this week. His name was Doug Kendall. Uh, the name you'll probably never even hear of. His obituary was in the Times today. Uh, but he was a, a liberal originalist, right? His entire vision was our, our Constitution is a progressive document. Uh, contrary to Justice Scalia's uh, uh, vision, and he viewed that the Privileges or Immunities Clause protected everything from abortion to a right to welfare. Uh, I, I didn't agree with him on this, but he was a very uh, committed and gifted advocate. He died at the age of 51 on Monday, to very, to, way too young, of cancer. Uh, so I'll give a little memory and shout out for Doug there. Um, but the his mission in life was to bring back the Privileges or Immunities Clause into existence. That was his like life's work. And unfortunately, the court uh, rebuffed him and me and, and many others in the McDonald's case. Any other questions on Slaughterhouse? We'll, we'll get to, I promise we'll get to Bradwell in a minute. I promise. Any other questions on Slaughterhouse? Okay. Let's move on to Bradwell v. Illinois. Okay. This is actually a picture of Miss Bradwell. Um, this is Myra Bradwell. 
Uh, all right, Sandra, we'll start off there. I don't remember where we are, but we can start. Both the facts are brattle since you're so empathetic. Okay, what happened here? Come on, you're all excited, though. Both the facts here. Uh-huh. Okay, good. So effectively, at the time, there was not really law school. It didn't exist the way it does today. So you, you were usually an apprentice to a lawyer who would read the law. And uh, if you – there was, it was actually not even an exam either. You would actually be admitted to the bar because you had spent a number of years as an apprentice, right? So she had been an assistant to her a husband who was a lawyer. She went to the Illinois Supreme Court and said, hey, uh, please admit me to the bar. And at the time, there was actually a law that prohibited women from entering uh, the bar. So she said, oh, cool. We have this new amendment, right, this 14th Amendment. I'm a citizen. Let me go – let me go seek for my privileges or immunities. So she filed suit challenging the fact they would not admit her to the bar based on the 14th Amendment. Now, what's interesting, Sandra, is we're looking at the 14th Amendment, right? Which provision do you think she should be relying on? Which is like the most obvious one she should be looking to? Even better. Why do you think equal protection would be, the, would be the most obvious clause to rely on? Yeah, exactly, right? That, that basically the law is being applied differently to men and women. And indeed, it says any person. It doesn't say any man. It says any person, right? This is a testament to how important privileges or immunities were. If you were alive in 1873, this is where the money was at, right? Her lawyer was not stupid. He was going where he thought the strongest chance of success was. And that was the issue the court re uh, 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 reached. So the difficulty in the, the, the Bradwell case, which I think is what upsets uh, Sandra so much, I'll call on her in a minute, is how it was decided the day after Slaughterhouse, right? So you had the five justices in the majority, right? They said that this doesn't mean a thing. Do you have any problem with their votes? If they said that 14th Amendment doesn't mean anything. Is there any contradiction there from one to the next? Okay. Right. So the majority, the five judges in the majority, they basically said slaughterhouse, 14th Amendment doesn't mean a damn thing. But I can sense Sandra's rage coming, right? The, 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 the concurring decisions, right? The other decisions were basically saying, well, this is different than slaughterhouse, right? Uh, I'll just go, Maria, this is different than slaughterhouse, right? So uh, uh, how did the court or the judges in particular go about distinguishing the facts in Bradwell from the facts in uh, Slaughterhouse. Good, good. And and Maria, what about the what about the right of women to pursue a vocation of their choice? What did the court say about that? Just say it. It's okay. We're adults here. Yeah. Like what? Rearing of children. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. Okay. But yeah. So, so this this opinion, and whenever I teach it every year, I always I always get this reaction. Uh, uh, you know, every year I teach it, but. The opinion represents the view of uh, uh, men towards women in the in the 1800s. I mean, uh, when you guys study property, do you remember coverture? Right? Okay. So this idea in property that historically, when a woman married a man, whatever property she now acquires is not hers. There's actually a cover, if you will, that all the property belongs to the husband. It essentially belongs to both of them. But when a woman gets married, her personal identity disappears. It's effectively a single married entity. And you'll say this in property at some point. Um, this opinion reflects that. So I'll read some more egregious quotes by today's standards, at least. So the, the, the Justice, uh, this is Justice Bradley, says, man is or should be woman's protector and defender. Uh, there's a natural and proper timidity and delicacy of the female sex unfit for many occupations of civil life. Okay, the husband is the head and the representative of the family. This one, I think, is the best quote. 
The paramount destiny and mission of women are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. Popping babies, as you said, <laughs> right? This is the law of the creator. And the rules of civil society must be adapted to the general constitution of things and cannot be based on exceptional cases, right? We give the hardiest concurrence to modern society that's multiplying the avenues of women's advancements. But we are not prepared to say that this is a fundamental right, okay? Not every citizen of every age, sex, and condition is qualified for every position, okay? Right, and again, I have that, that part that made you uh, amp up. So I, I, I wanna just, I'll, I'll caution you, because we're gonna read, when we get to the racial cases, when you read Dred Scott, it's of a similar jarring nature. Um, and when I want you to read it, try not to read it through 2015 sensibilities. Try to, the best as you can, read it through 1880 whatever sensibilities. Um, because, let me explain why. The fact that a judge put this in his opinion as if it was no big deal, that says a lot, right? This is not something he was embarrassed by. He was publishing this in a written opinion for the world to see. And I think that that's important for you to keep in mind. This was so common and so accepted that there was nothing um, even jarring about it. Um, Dred Scott, in contrast, the language was used in Dred Scott was far worse than anything else that was even spoken at the time. Tawny went out of his way to be a, 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 a egregious um, uh, opinion. I mean, you'll, you'll read it and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't want to spoil it. Um, there was actually only a dissent by Chief Justice Salmon Chase. Uh, he was quite ill at the time. He died a month later. He had no written opinion. So there wasn't even a dissent to perhaps vindicate the other positions. I think we're in. Yes, ma'am. I have a quick question. Um, with her being acquitted, I'm sure she would have had to go into court with him. And, so wouldn't that have come up a little earlier? Right. So I'm sure there were political things here where the Illinois Supreme Court probably put the kibosh at the very end. Right? She was a lawyer, I'm sorry, her husband's a lawyer, probably the most local members of the bar were progressives in front of Chicago, they didn't care. And with the Springfield Capitol, that's probably where this blew up. So the aftermath, though, of this case is very interesting. Um, and this is perhaps a consolation prize. By the time this case reached the Supreme Court, the Illinois legislature basically said women can join. So the case was moot, right? By the time the Supreme Court resolved this case, the entire issue was moot because women were admitted to the bar in Illinois. Um, interestingly enough, she, <laughs> Mrs. Bradwell never bothered applying for membership after that because she, she was really annoyed. Uh, but a, a nice um, uh, decision is in 1890, the Illinois Supreme Court reversed its decision, they admitted Bradwell. So even though she never reapplied, they basically just reversed the decision and they let her in. And this one's kind of called 1892, uh, the United States Attorney General move for her admission at the United States Supreme Court bar. So this is when you know, the Attorney General moves for admission. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and she became a journalist. Uh, this is her uh, later in the, uh, for the Chicago Legal Times. And uh, there's a book about her called America's First Lawyer, um, if you're a first woman lawyer, if you're interested in reading more about her. Um, one other note I'll mention very briefly. Um, even though there was no... Um, even though there was no protection for entering into vocation, right? What do we do about the right to vote? Okay. It's very easy for court to say, well, you know, women of the fair sex, they're timid, whatever else. They're not skilled for entering into a vocation like being a lawyer. But what about voting? Okay. So, um, Earl, what did the 15th Amendment do? What was the purpose of the 15th Amendment? Oh, by the way, before I forget, this is actually a letter that Bradwell wrote to Susan B. Anthony, which is like a cool thing when, like, you know, famous, I love when famous historical figures intersect. It's, you know, it's always very funny. Uh, like the Jetsons made Flintstones, right? This is a kind of a cool letter. So, Earl, what, do, what does the 15th Amendment do? Just read it for us, please. Okay. 
good stuff right there. Earl, does the Constitution grant anyone the right to vote? Is it trick question? Is it trick question? Onslow, what would you say? Does the 15th Amendment Onslow grant the right to vote? It does not. What does it say, Onslow? The rights of the citizens of the U.S. to vote shall not be denied. Yeah. So what's interesting about the Constitution. Thank you. Exactly right. Yeah. What's interesting about the Constitution, and this will blow your mind. Does the Constitution grant any rights? No. Go to the Bill of Rights. Just go to the First Amendment, right? Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. Does it say the people have the right to speak freely? No. The right to keep their arms shall not be infringed. Does it say we have the right to bear arms? No. The Constitution is framed in terms of restricting the power of government, not in terms of granting us rights. And that's an important point people don't appreciate. It. We do not have, it's called a Bill of Rights, which is actually a misnomer. There are no rights conferred by the Constitution. And the right to vote is no different. The Constitution never says you have the right to vote. It says here that you can't deny the right to vote based on your uh, based on your race, right? And then we go to the, uh, to the to the 18th Amendment, right? I'm sorry, the uh, 19th Amendment. We have suffrage. The 19th Amendment says the right to citizens to vote should not be denied on the basis of any kind of sex. So there is no actual right to vote. And then later we on we have the amendment, uh, which was a mistake, raising voting age, allowing voting age 18. Uh, did I say that loud? Yeah. <laughs> Mistake. So, <laughs> anyway, I'm mostly kidding. <laughs> so, what do we have there, though? Why did we need an amendment to protect the right to vote against race? Well, because the southern states were effectively making it impossible for blacks to vote. Uh, what happened after the 15th Amendment? We had grandfather clauses, we had poll taxes, we had literacy tests, we had every manner which were meant to make it impossible for blacks to vote. This is a history which we are familiar with. But what about women? Right? What about women? After the 15th Amendment was ratified, Kara, did women have the right to vote in the Constitution? All right, so you're a lawyer, right? You're a lawyer in 1875. Your client, her name is Susan B. Anthony. This actually happened. Susan B. Anthony said, look, nor shall any state deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. You're Susan B. Anthony's lawyer. This actually happened, right? What's your argument? How can you vote? Yeah, so this is actually a true story, right? Susan B. Anthony was a suffragist. And she was actually able to go to a, um, a, a, a the ballot place and said, hey, Mr. Ballot Man, here's the Constitution. She had a pop one, I'm sure. Uh, uh, it says here, I don't know if she had one. I hope she had one. I want a copy of it, right? Here's the Constitution, right? Let me in. Let me vote. And you know what? He gave her a ballot. He gave her a ballot. The judges are not the only one who gets to interpret the Constitution. Never forget that, my friends. Right? So we have this case now, Minor versus Happersett. Kara, did the Supreme Court agree with Susan B. Anthony on this one? No, they did not. What did the court hold in Minor versus Happersett? They held that um, the right to vote uh -huh. was not the right. Uh-huh. And that it was a political right. And that, you know, the women ran. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what we see here again is the language of the 14th Amendment is framed very broadly, capacious, if you will, very spaciously. And the decisions apply a very parsimonious, very strict construction to the language. Right? We had Slaughterhouse constrict it, right? We had Bradwell make it right narrow. We have now uh, uh, Happersett read it very narrowly. And these decisions, one after the next, are chopping away, like, you know, just one axe after another, the broad language of the 14th Amendment. So even though indeed it does says, you know, equal protection of the law to all persons, and you know, I could make the argument that denying a woman the ballot is not giving her the equal protection of the laws, they lost. Now, there is an actual better defense of this provision, and the argument goes like this. Jessica, if the court needed an I'm sorry, if we needed an amendment to give 
blacks the vote, would we also need an amendment to give women the vote? Yeah, and this is kind of the argument in the back, right? If you needed three-fourths of the states to amend the Constitution to provide suffrage to free blacks, who never had the right to vote before, at least in most states in the South, right? Then women, who also basically never had the right to vote, would similarly need an amendment. I mean, that's not an ironclad position. In fact, uh, a number of states did give women the vote. Uh, New Jersey, uh, it's a Jersey thing, right? Of all states, actually allowed women to vote during the time of the American Revolution. And I've been trying to find this for years, but I'm convinced that at one of the ratifying conventions of the New Jersey Constitutional Convention, a woman voted. I, I, I have no proof of it, but they had the vote at the time. I'm sure at least there's one. I, I'll find it eventually. I've been looking for this for like eight years. I'll find it, I promise. The other clue we have in the 14th Amendment is found in section two. Okay. So remember I said that if uh, states deprive the free blacks the right to have representation, that states would lose members of Congress? So it speaks here very clearly. It's denied to any male inhabitants of states at the age of 21. It specifically refers to male inhabitants getting voting rights, right? So the 14th Amendment specifically references male inhabitants. That's a decent textual clue that women were not meant to be protected by the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Not ironclad, but it does say they're male inhabitants if they're denied the right to vote. Yes, sir. Did, uh, and I don't have any historical context here. I'm just curious in the way, it's the first time it's ever come to my mind. Did the, uh, the these rights, uh, the black rights, did they spur women's rights? Were there women there who said, hey, African-American males this is now happening as a result, you know, you might, it might have been someone who was a past, you know, slave owner or something like that and thought, if these people can, you know, if they now have the right to do this, I should have the right to do this. Yeah, I mean, it took a while, right? It took a while. So you had the 14th Amendment in 1868, and you had the 19th Amendment was like in 1917, give or take. So it took like, you know, 50 years. But the suffrage movement definitely looked to the blueprint of the civil rights movement to try to extend rights to women. You're absolutely right. Other questions on minor? It's not a minor case. But, uh. And again, the, the court just basically ruled away the 13th Amendment, pri the Privilege of Immunities Clause, none of it mattered. Um, okay. Any questions on that? All right, Debbie, let's talk about Strata versus West Virginia. This case is actually one of the few outliers where actually, like, you know, good thing happened, right? What, hap what happened in Strata? Mm. And, you know, Good. Good. And I want to just before I move on too far, um, uh, uh, to, to Roy's question, which I should have answered this a minute ago. Um, the, the women suffragists had this document called the Declaration of Sentiments. It was published in Seneca. The Seneca Falls, somewhere in upstate New York. Seneca Falls, yeah. And it listed a number of, it was effectively a Declaration of Independence for Women saying we need to have certain rights. And among those listed, it's probably too small, uh, but it effectively says a right of property, right, and a right to earn wages. And those actually, uh, by the same token that the blacks want to be able to work for themselves and have, you know, free labor, women indeed want the same, they can actually earn wages. So the movement did have uh, a number of similarities. Uh, this, this sign says, no self-respecting woman should wish to work with the excess of a party that ignores her sex. It says Susan B. Anthony. I think that was later in her life. And okay, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. It was up by three years. Okay. Sorry, Debbie, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So Strader was a case involving... Uh, excluding blacks from juries as a matter of law. Um, this is different from peremptory strikes. Have you ever studied, anyone ever deal with peremptory strikes? That's to be Kentucky. You'll study this case in criminal procedure. So today, right, if you're in a jury trial and the prosecutor is, uh, you know, defense prosecutor picking a jury, the prosecutor can throw out specific jurors, okay? There are two types of ways to throw a juror out a strike for cause and a peremptory strike. What's a strike for cause? 
what happens if it turns out that the uh, the juror is like best friends with the witness, right? You gotta throw the juror out. He's a conflict of interest. But in every case, the prosecutor has a certain number of strikes where he can throw out a juror for whatever reason, doesn't have to give a reason. So there was a, uh, a, a fairly common pattern in American history where if there was a white defendant, uh, then the uh, prosecutor would throw out all the black jurors and using all those peremptory strikes against the black jurors and effectively making an all-white jury. So in a case called Batson v. Kentucky, B-A-T-S-O-N, um, the Supreme Court held that using peremptory strikes in a racial fashion is unconstitutional. Uh, there was a subsequent case, was it called? Uh, was it something concrete, J something concrete, I can't remember the name. Uh, uh, they held the same for women, that if you used peremptory strikes against women, um, uh, it's unconstitutional. Um, so this case, though, far into dates it. West Virginia enacted a statute that said all jurors must be white. Okay. You have a defendant, Mr. Strouder. He's being prosecuted for a crime. He was indicted for murder in West Virginia in 1880. He has an all-white jury because blacks were excluded. Mildred, what do you think the chances are Mr. Um, Strouder will be acquitted by this jury in 1880 West Virginia that's all-white? Yeah. So everyone's need to kill Mockingbird, right? You notice the jury is all-white? Okay. So part of that uh, uh, was, was probably, I mean, it was, it was a book and a movie, right? But, but part of it was actually a reflection of that. Uh, uh, even in the 1950s, blacks were excluded from um, uh, juries because it was easier to get a conviction that way of Tom Robinson, who was the, remember, was accused of, of, of the rape of Mayela Maya Yule. So Strouder had interesting legal strategy. So first he said, wait a minute, right? We have this 14th Amendment here. 14th Amendment somewhere. We have this 14th Amendment here. I am being deprived of a host of rights because the jury is all white. And then he actually asked to have the case removed to federal court. And that was a gutsy decision. He wanted it to be in federal court, not in a state court, so we would get a better shake in a federal court, right? So Mildred, how did the court go about analyzing this case? Good. Oh, good. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Right. Yeah. The court says very clearly that all persons, both of a color to white, quote, excuse me, shall stand equal before the laws of the state, that no discrimination shall be made against them by law because of their color. Okay. Let's see. Um, uh, uh, Kathy, yeah. you haven't studied a case like uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, but you'll do that, you know, another week or two. In that case, the court upheld segregated rail cars. How do you think you justify a decision permitting segregation and, you know, public accommodation, like the civil rights case within a minute? Juries can't be segregated, but hotels and restaurants and trains can. How do you think the government or the court would distinguish those two issues? No, no, the, the, the question is this, right? Here the court seems pretty easy to conclude that a uh, segregated jury is bad. But in the next case, you read civil rights cases, they say, well, there's no problem with having a segregated opera house or segregated restaurant. What do you think the difference between the two is? What's the biggest difference, Kathy, between a jury and a restaurant? No, no. What's the biggest difference between a jury and a restaurant? Who does a jury work for? 
Yeah, and who, who works for, who's a private business work for? Yeah, this is, this is, thank you, this is exactly what I'm getting at. The Strouder case is an outlier. It's an exception, okay? It's virtually the only case during this time period, and I mean, there are not many, but it's one of the only cases during this time period where the court actually found that the Equal Protection Clause prohibits a state practice of racial discrimination. It's basically the only one. If you read through the you know, your list of cases, this is it. And I think what is motivating the court in this decision was the fact that they were dealing here with the law and the courts themselves, right? That it was actually the courts that were discriminating against it. Because even though it was a prosecutor throwing out the black jurors, the court has to approve it. Right? If, if the prosecutor says, I want to strike him or strike her, the judge must say, okay. So I think part of it is that the, the, that the court felt this was part of the laws of the state. Mark. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. This is the only case this year that found that limits state uh, segregation. There may be one or two other small ones, but this is just about it. Like uh, nothing, nothing of any, any, any significance. Also, uh, and, and there's a question for uh, Pam. The court had often read the 14th Amendment narrowly as being only about eradicating slavery and eradicating the vestiges of slavery. How does this case fit in with that theme? Yeah, yeah I, I think that this reminds the courts of a lynch mob, right? And the sort of badges or vestiges or reminders of slavery that are readily apparent in having this all-white jury convict this guy of murder, um, I think reminds them far more than Ms. Bradwell trying to get a law license, right? Ms. Bradwell trying to get a law license, that doesn't remind you of the reason why it's the Civil War. Or Ms. Happersett trying to vote, you know, we didn't fight a Civil War over that. But a black guy getting lynched by a jury, yeah, that, that, you know, that rings a bell. So even the court had read the, the theme and purpose of the 14th Amendment so narrowly, I think it, this case fits in with that genre uh, much more strongly. Mary? I think another aspect of this case is that the court kind of takes uh, responsibility or ownership of the detriment that these individuals suffered through slavery when it uh, says that the education level and the training that yeah. they received is at a lower level and that the purpose of the 14th Amendment is, is to protect it going uh, Yeah. It's a, it's a good observation, right? And again, this fits in with why do we have a 14th Amendment to fix slavery? Like, th this fits in with that meme. Caleb, is your hand up? No. Anyone else? All right. Any other? Yes. I'll end up getting around it through peremptory strike because. That came like 90 years later. Right, because they ended up seeing still alive, white jurors. Yeah. So, what this was was not peremptory strikes, but an actual statute excluding blacks. So if a black guy showed up for jury duty, like, okay, you can go home now. Right, they, they, didn't, they didn't even consider him for a jury member. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, good question. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? I never thought about that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, so 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 it was a, it was a female, it was a black female. Is that what you're asking? Well, well. Oh, oh, oh! I see what you're saying. So, if it was a, a female, with all, all, all man jury with the with the men vote against because they're men. Um, at the time, there were no female juries, period. So, you, there were no female juries. That only came much later. So, yes, all juries were men to begin with. There would be no problem because every jury was men. The only question was whether it would be black men allowed in the jury. Uh, Mark, Marco, you have the first. Given a lot of time on the no female sitting in the jury, yeah. a female uh, is being charged with murder and then she takes that during the Supreme Court, is she going to get the same protection under the 14th? No, no, because again, they were trying to fix the problems of slavery and women were not that. Right. 
We didn't fight a civil war over women. Susan B. Anthony and others came 80 years later. Not 80, maybe 50 years later. And so I had somewhere here. Caleb? You were saying something a minute ago, and I, I missed some of it. You were, you were commenting that the court was focusing on the responsibilities of the court in this situation because they still had to make a decision on whether or not to allow the prosecutors, you know, striking of a particular juror. I think that's right. So was there any more to that? I, I No, I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that blurs in the background. I think the court feels some responsibility for the fact that this was a judicial proceeding. And an officer of the court was actually permitting this to be done, right? That officer of the court was actually enforcing, saying, "If you're a black juror, you can go home now, right? You're excused. You can't come. You came and enter the court." Marco, that law in the state? Well, the statute. The statute was only white people allowed in the jury. So the statute says, if a black person shows up for jury duty, okay, you can go home now. Yeah, I mean, the court was sanctioning and actually enforcing that statute because that's actually a statute administered by the courts. Yes? I think it's kind of side commentary that there are important cases Such a good question. Why is the Sixth Amendment not relevant? What did I say about the Bill of Rights in the states? Did the Bill of Rights apply to the states yet? No, you haven't done this yet. But for the first, you know, 30 or 40 years after the 14th Amendment was ratified, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. The Sixth Amendment did not control West Virginia at all. So they could not cite to us the Sixth Amendment. I'm so glad you asked that. It was actually my notes to ask about later, but you, 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 jumped, you, you jumped the gun, which I always love. Yeah, they couldn't. The only amendment that affects states is the 14th. The Sixth Amendment only affected the federal government. The Sixth Amendment trial by jury was incorporated, I think, the 1950s or so, or 40s, can't remember. Any other questions on the um, Strouder case? This is, again, this is the outlier. This is like, <coughs> like yay, the, 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 good, the good part one, but then after that, they get much worse. So let's talk about the civil rights case for a second. And I want to juxtapose the 13th and the 14th Amendment. So we said that the 13th Amendment applies to private actors. It says, involuntary servitude of slavery shall not exist anywhere in the United States. No slavery. That means government can't hold slaves. That means private parties can't hold slaves. So if Congress is acting pursuant to its powers in Section 2, can they reach private conduct? Can they reach businesses? To have slaves? The answer is yes. Okay. The Fourteenth Amendment says very clearly: No state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. No state shall deny to any person equal protection of the laws. State, 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 state. When Congress is acting pursuant to its Fourteenth Amendment powers, can it reach? States? Yes. When Congress is acting pursuant to its 14th Amendment powers, can they reach private individuals? Okay, that is the issue of the civil rights cases, which was an 1883 decision. Okay. Now, when we studied, you'll recall, when we studied Katzenbach v. McClung in Hearts of Atlanta, where Janine's grandmother was having a, having a dip in the pool, right? When we study those cases, those were civil rights cases where Congress tried to eradicate discrimination in places of private employment. Okay? Exactly what Congress tried to do in 1875 to eliminate discrimination in these sorts of hotels and stuff, they only got around to doing 70 years later in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we recall, what power authorized Congress to enact the Civil Rights Act, the Civil rights Act of 1964? The Commerce Clause. Do you remember what they said to Sheba about the about the Fourteenth Amendment? Do you remember what they said? Anybody? Okay, I think I flagged it. To go back to look at the notes, the court said we don't need to reach the Fourteenth Amendment issue. Okay, the reason why they didn't reach the Fourteenth Amendment issue is that the civil rights cases foreclosed it. The civil rights cases, which we'll discuss in very very short order, said that the Fourteenth Amendment only affects states. 
that Congress cannot use its 14th Amendment powers to regulate private businesses. So this is why we had a massive explosion in the power of the Commerce Clause with respect to civil rights cases. Had the, slot, had, had the civil rights cases in 1885 turned out differently, it's very likely we've had to go down the Commerce Clause route. Okay. So the actual civil rights cases was a series, I think, four or five, uh, five consolidated cases that involved many different businesses. So this was actually uh, the Grand Opera House in New York City. Uh, unless you think that all the segregation is going on in the South, New York City had a segregated opera house as well. Uh, I also have a picture of McGuire's Opera House in San Francisco. So unless you think it was in the South, San Francisco had a segregated opera house. Uh, also, there's uh, the Jefferson City uh, uh, Nickel Inn and a hotel in Topeka, Kansas. I could not find pictures of either of those. So, why am I talking so much? The, uh, Marco, what did the let's let's take this step by step. Marco, could Congress rely on their Thirteenth Amendment power to require that public facilities um, uh, desegregate? That's right. Why could Congress not rely on their Thirteenth Amendment powers to force these businesses? To desegregate. No, let's just stay in the 13th Amendment for a second. We'll go to the 14th in a minute. Why can the 13th Amendment not authorize Congress to control private businesses in places of public accommodation? Read it. What, what does it say, Marco? Read it. Okay, stop. Okay. Has that amendment been violated when a opera house segregates, has different facilities for men and women, uh, for blacks and whites? Has this command, Marco, been violated? What would you say? No. Has there been slavery? Has there been an involuntary servitude? Okay. So the court basically says, listen, we're going to read these terms narrowly. Holding a segregated opera house is not slavery. It's not involuntary servitude. Right? Therefore, Congress cannot reach this private conduct through its 13th Amendment powers. Okay. Walter, what about the 14th Amendment? What does the majority opinion say about the 14th Amendment? Can Congress regulate private businesses through the 14th Amendment? No. Why not? Because uh, it's an authorization. Uh, What's the magic word there that, 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 that limits it? Who does the 14th Amendment regulate? States, yes, sir. The 14th Amendment only regulates state action. This is what's called the state action doctrine, if you want to put this on your notes, the state action doctrine. The 14th Amendment only controls state action. So while the 13th Amendment controls individual action, they said that this ain't slavery. The 14th Amendment does guarantee equal protection, but only against government actors. We'll get to how they had segregated schools until 1955 later, right? That was separate but equal. But here, here they said, Fourth Amendment doesn't cover it. Now, the dissent, only one judge in dissent is by a, a justice named Justice John Marshall Harlan. He was actually named for John Marshall, who was an icon of mine. I actually named the nonprofit that I run, the Harlan Institute, after him. And Justice Harlan is famous most for his dissents. Uh, you'll read in about two weeks, he wrote the dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, saying that uh, separate is not equal, that we have a colorblind constitution, a very powerful movement that was not uh, uh, vindicated until nearly 70 years later in Brown. Um, he also wrote a solo dissent in the civil rights cases. And, and his dissent, I think, is, is quite powerful. So, Steve, how does Justice Harlan explain the 13th Amendment? 
is it limited to just actual slavery or servitude? All right, I'll, I'll come back to you next class, okay? Mark, how does Justice Harlan read the 13th Amendment to uh, authorize this, this Civil Rights Act? Well, he said it's, it's, it's well, I think he said it was made to uh, act to protect uh, people against deprivation because of their rights. Good. What's that phrase he uses, right? It's not slavery, but what's this phrase he uses? Let's see if you picked it up. Um, no, Yvette. Yes, yes. Say it louder, please. Badges of servitude, right? What, Yvette? What are these badges of servitude? What, what, what's a badge? What, 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 what's a badge? Yeah. So, what Harlan's saying, Yvette, is: Are these people still slaves, or are they still in servitude? No, but what does segregation remind them of? Yeah, this is Harlan's insight. He says, listen, let's not be so stingy with our construction of the 13th Amendment, right? It says slavery, it says servitude, but it doesn't mean actual literal chains on you. There are various institutions that people can create to basically recreate the, uh, the state of slavery. And a segregated restaurant, is like a badge of servitude. It's like, you know, you remember the scarlet letter, right? You're wearing a badge saying, okay, I have to sit over there. I can't sit over here. This is a, a uh, you know, a reaffirmation that I am not free. And it's basically bringing us back to the time of slavery. So Harlan says the 13th Amendment justifies this because these are called badges or incidents of slavery. And, and his opinion is very broad in his language. Listen, the 13th Amendment wasn't just backing slavery, right? It decreed, quote, universal civil freedom, right? Its purpose wasn't just to destroy the institution and then, you know, let people go back to bondage. It was to uh, uh, eliminate these burdens and disabilities, these burdens and disabilities that were lingering in the Jim Crow era and lingering from the black coats. Harlan writes that under the 13th Amendment, Congress can regulate direct conduct they can directly regulate this conduct to the extent that it infringes on these rights and brings people back to the state of servitude. And this is exactly what Congress has the power to enact under Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. Okay. Any questions on Harlan's reading the 13th Amendment? Again, this was a dissent. He was alone. Uh, but this was a very expansive reading of the Constitution uh, that none of his other uh, uh, brothers uh, concurred with. Okay. And Harlan doesn't stop there. Indeed, he actually reads the 14th Amendment, which we said only applies to state action, uh, similarly broadly, where he says that these are even you know civil rights that people have to protect. Um, Harlan would effectively read Congress having power to take any steps that are appropriate to eradicate the vestiges, the bonds, the badges of slavery. Okay, um, Of course, Harlan's opinion was only in a dissent. And uh, uh, for decades afterwards, and even till to this day, um, Congress does not have the power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to regulate private conduct. That's why the hate crimes legislation I mentioned earlier in the class has been justified under Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. And you recall, I said the statute's probably unconstitutional. If you read slavery to be very narrow, right, and you're applying a hate crime statute to uh, apply to, say, discrimination against, I don't know, uh, an Asian American, well, that's not what we fought a civil war, war over. No, under the prevailing interpretations of the 14th and 13th Amendment, that statute probably falls. The courts have upheld them. I think they're probably ignoring precedent, but that's story. Yes, so states, states can do whatever they want. States have police power. The question whether it be a federal hate crime. Which, saying, yeah, so, so, oh, but I'll give you a perfect example. So there was actually a case in Texas where, um, oh God, what was it? 
some some guys were shouting racial slurs and they beat up this black guy by the Amtrak station here in town. Texas filed a state hate crime charge against him, and then the Fed stepped in to bring a federal charge. And then he moved to have his indictment dismissed because the statute was unconstitutional. The court, Fifth Circuit, upheld it. I think they're probably wrong. Uh, Texas was freely able to prosecute it. Uh, but that's one of the few applications now of the 13th Amendment. Okay. So any questions on Harlan's dissent? So let me try and summarize, because we had a lot of material today. I'm actually very proud that we got through this without keeping you a minute later. Um, the 14th Amendment uses very, very broad, expansive language. And uh, many of the framers uh, uh, who spoke of it had wanted to be applied in many ways that perhaps they didn't quite anticipate. Um, but shortly after the 14th Amendment was ratified, the Supreme Court read each provision narrowly. Privileges and immunities to slaughterhouse, narrow. Right? Minor versus Happer said protection. And Bradwell, narrow. Uh, uh, even, even the um, 13th Amendment in the civil rights cases, narrow. And it wasn't really until the mid-20th century that Congress turned then to the Commerce Clause to uh, uh, eliminate various forms of discrimination in private establishments. And then in Brown v. Board and subsequent cases, the Equal Protection Clause was expanded to provide a, a, a desegregation for schools. But that even took another... 20, 30 years to actually finish up depending how you count. Any questions? Good luck on the midterm. I won't be here on Monday, and I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you so much.